Hey, uh, so um, sorry I haven't posted for a while, it's been really busy. Um, but I thought um, I would just uh, do a quick video about my approach to fretboard mapping as I teach it now, which is not the way I learnt, but I think it's quite an effective way to get um, uh, scales and arpeggios and things under your fingers quickly on the guitar with enough flexibility to use them in improvisation, but also be able to join them together into larger structures. So it's really very simple. Um, most players, I think, learn like these, you know, the caged system, for instance, C, A, G, E, D. So you have these sort of prototypical chord shapes on the guitar and then you, you know, you learn to play, you know, what I whatever it is in position, right? Over, like, from the highest note you can get to whatever, to the same note. And the majority of these shapes are like two octave for two and a half, or in that case, maybe two and a bit. You know, and uh, what I suggest doing, and what, what I work through with my students, is breaking it down into octaves, right? So all fans of Wes Montgomery will know octaves, of course. And those are the four main shapes we use. So these are, you know, with the two notes, um, uh, two strings apart. Okay, so that's four shapes, right? Now, because we're playing in standard guitar tuning, we have to modify the shape when we get to the B string. Uh, people who play in perfect fourths won't have that problem. Um, now, uh, there's also ones where it's separated by three strings, so these, there's three shapes of those. So this one. That's practical for the Wes Montgomery licks, but um, we will be using those for fretboard mapping as well, okay? And then there's other ones which are only separated by one string. These tend to be very long across the string, right? Uh, so they take you up along the neck, for instance, uh, if I choose an A here and an A there. Hmm, intonation's not my friend, but anyway, you get the idea. Um, that, that, that gives you that, that octave, which is quite good if you want to learn to play up and down the neck, but not necessarily where you would start with this, okay? So what we can do is we can simply start by um, coming up with a uh, triad shape. Right, so this, for this octave it's that. For this octave it's also that, which is convenient. And for this octave, um, that is also that as well. Okay, so let's say that first octave and add the seventh to it. So that's a major seventh now. And we can populate the rest of the notes in. So if we know that shape from the minor major seventh, it's important information to take in that. Then we know that we can put in a two, two, three, four is a half step of the three, five, six, seven. And we're gonna run out to seventh and down because we because I'm the student of Barry Harris and that's the way we always do it. So we've got the arpeggio, triad, and the scale. Okay, so that's pretty handy. Okay, so you do the next octave. Okay, tuning in the guitar, that goes up to the seventh there. Now you wouldn't necessarily come up with it this quickly, you might have to take some time to learn the shapes. So I'm just gonna take you through all of the ones for G, all the obvious ones. So that's that octave shape, separated by three strings, separated by two strings. You can also do it like that, but I find for jazz, like second finger, uh, feels like a good place to, to start most of these things with. Um, okay, so that is good. Uh, now we're going to go up to the next octave. So we've got this one. We've also got that. Okay, got that. Also got this. So four shapes are the same, the same pictures, right? Okay, and then uh, this one up here, next octave up. I mean, you can get up to there. And maybe up to here. Not terribly easy on this guitar, but people who play super strats will have no problem with that. Okay, um, so that is um, that is major scale all positions. Now, um, the advantage of this, I think, is partly because uh, in in jazz or bebop anyway, we don't often find ourselves playing scale runs that last for more than an octave. So, a good example would be Donna Lee, which is one of the longer scale runs in in bebop language that I can think of off the top of my head, but it's uh, well, I do. And that is just, doesn't even get to the octave, because it goes to um, 
A natural instead of A flat. So, you know, <laughs> but that's only one octave, right? And uh, the very Harris um, scale running exercises are up to the seventh and back. So if you're running a blues, for instance, it's B flat seven. So B flat seven, E flat seven, B flat seven, up and down, E flat seven, down to the E, right? Down to the third of G seven, and then F seven up and down, and then B seven up, B flat seven up and down. Okay, and that's literally <laughs> almost how fast we do it in <laughs> in the workshop. I mean, uh, you know that, but like it, it took me a long time to get to the point where I could just go, you know, and, and then have the access over those scales. And finally, or even. I found having these one octave shapes really helped help me map out the scales all over the neck because when I was thinking of those massive uh, two or one and a half octave positions that we traditionally learned, whether we learn like conventional sort of um, seven position system or cage system or whatever, I found them to be unwieldy. So these little octave systems, get uh, little octave um, fingerings get you in right away and, and you can quickly um, play the scale. Now the other real advantage of it is once you know your major scale, in order to derive all the other scales, or if you know your major seventh arpeggio, to derive all the other arpeggios, it's pretty simple. So if you want to flat the three and make it into a melodic minor, we can. Sorry, that's the third there. Take it down a half step. Sorry, I went up to the octave there, very bad. One, two, flat three, four, five, six, seven, six, five, four, flat three, two, one, right? Okay, let's go back to the major. Now the other thing you can do is you can flat the seventh and make it into a mixolydian stroke dominant scale. So, like that, right? So take the seventh down by half step. I'm whizzing through all of these options. Um, I, I would say that the, the thing to take away from this is not necessarily my fingerings, don't look at my fingers. You've got to work this out yourself, otherwise you won't remember it, okay? So the thing to bear in mind is compare and derive everything from everything else. So if you have a fingering for the major scale, turn it into a melodic minor fingering, turn it into a dominant scale fingering, turn it into a Dorian fingering, a uh, Lydian Dorian, anything else you can think of. Um, the point is to get into the process of being able to play, uh, you know, know where the flat threes are and the threes and everything else. So if you number them when you practice them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Let's, let's flatten the one. I don't think that scale even has a name, okay? Uh, let's go back to, let's do harmonic major, let's flatten the sixth. One, two, three, four, five, flat six, seven, one, two, three, four, yeah, four, four. You know, it might be more practical to refinger that note, the E flat on a different string, right? But this, this gives you quickly a, a way of building up your knowledge of the fretboard. Now, um, and because there's no repeated notes, it's not confusing fingering-wise. Same for arpeggios, G major seventh, G may, uh, let's go for G7, okay. Okay, let's go for a G minor seven, so a flat and third as well. It might be easier in that position. But try a few different ones until you find what works for you. Okay, um, and then uh, let's raise the seventh again to get a minor major seventh. Let's go back to the dominant seventh. Let's flat the five. Okay, all this stuff, right, you know, just whisk through it. So then we do that in the next, next octave. Maybe use that shape. Dominant, dominant flat five. Okay, uh, let's do back to major seventh. Let's do minor major. So, not particularly pleasant fingering, so we're gonna put that note on there. Right, okay, flat in the seventh as well. Minor seventh, right? Same thing here. That's a bit of a stretch. Let's put it there instead. Flat the third as well. Flat the fifth, why not? You know, okay, so like all of those options, just, just go through them. You're gonna have to start off a lot slower than me if you're not used to this kind of work. Okay, third, well fourth, I, I can't, I've lost track, but another really useful thing about this is the way you can join them up. So if I join this octave up to that octave with a major scale, first octave, second octave. See the arpeggio. So I'm actually playing it right. Yeah, that's it.
do it with two fingers, it's quite fun. Yeah, these nice diagonal positions, that's the point. I mean, I could just use these two octaves. But I think, like, you know, sometimes when you position playing, you get a bit stuck, you know? I find that. So we go, so if we do the major scale all the way up. And we've got another slightly more extreme octave shape there. You know, okay, well. Sorry. Okay, so that hopefully gives you um, a little a little bit of a of a roadmap of how you could start to build up your knowledge of the neck a bit more. Um, and, and to do it for all scales and to do it for all arpeggios. Um, you know, another one would be that. You know, but that's also an octave. know along the neck as well so I, I think that kind of stuff is really really good um, and it's helped me a lot with my fretboard mapping which is not the greatest necessarily <laughs> um, but this kind of work is very much uh, something which guitarists have to grind through unlike say the piano um, and I just think the octave system just helps me you know locate and, and be able to modify those shapes in order to um, get a greater command of scales all over the neck. Um, one thing it's not great for is um, chords, because obviously chord voicings on the guitar, um, you know, we couldn't play that major seventh arpeggio as a chord without missing some notes out, right? It's limitations of the guitar, okay? So stuff like that obviously limits its applicability, but um, for scales and arpeggios and things like that, I think it's, uh, it's helped me a lot. And um, uh, this is something I came up with independently, but um, there, there are teachers who have taught this over the years, so it's not just not just something I came up with. But um, really, this was a, a logical, well, my, my, my logical response to how Barry Harris was getting us to practice scales in class, which was with these tight little up to the seventh and back things, you know. Um, and I found that thinking about scales this way is the only way I could practice that without just getting totally lost. So I hope you find it some help. Thanks for watching and uh, leave your comments below. Thanks, bye.